I don't think it's a coincidence that grief and depression have the same symptoms. I think what depression is in part is grief for your own needs not being met. When you're grieving for your own needs not being met, well, there's a lot we can do about that. When a human being is connected, their deeper needs as human beings are being met, and they feel that they are flowing into other people and other people are flowing into them. When people get banned together and fight for progressive change, it can absolutely happen. In a way, things are more hospitable to progressive change now than they've been for a long time because the system is falling apart and we can be the ones who build the alternative, right? And I think that's, that's really important for us to think about. For episode 47, my guest is the New York Times bestselling author, Johan Hari. As well as being a celebrated journalist, he has written two bestselling books, Chasing the Scream and Lost Connections, and did a TEDx talk that has been viewed more than 15 million times called Everything You Think You Know About Addiction Is Wrong. Johan and I first met many years ago through our interest in politics when we were fresh out of university. I remember one gathering that we were at in particular with lots of activist friends who were all unknown and now many of them are acclaimed authors, MPs or high up behind the scenes of UK politics. It stands out to me as it shows that people don't come up out of nowhere but through years of hard work and dedication. Johan and I spent the afternoon of the winter solstice together and discussed depression, anxiety, connection and how this all relates to the systems we have in Western society. Johan has a kaleidoscopic brain of facts and research which illustrate what is happening at this time and where the solutions are. And as a result, the interview ended up being our longest yet, as it's full of so many references and useful information. I feel that this topic is so key to everything. There is so much to consider here around depression and anxiety as symptoms of a broken society rather than something that is wrong with the individual. I love what Johan shares as solutions based in connection, community and systemic change. Please do get involved with our online community and share how these conversations have moved you and what they are sparking in you. I know that the recent conversation on deep adaptation and societal collapse leads to a need for processing. So let's do it together. We're also looking into organising a summer gathering in the UK, a weekend where we can get together. And I would love for informal gatherings of our community to happen all over the world in the different pockets where you are. So if you would like to organise something like this, please do get in touch. We had the Patreon video call a few days ago and Atula, one of our wonderful supporters, who also builds incredible mud homes, was saying for her that the podcast is like a circle, that each conversation layers on top of the ones before it rather than it being about one solution or one guest having the answer. It is this layering of questions and ways forward that support each other and sometimes contradict each other and ask us to address our inner and outer realities. It's a more feminine approach and this is how we create a beautiful future. I am receiving so much from these conversations as each one touches me. And together, they call forth a challenging and open-ended narrative for our expanding worlds. Don't forget to download our ebook gift for the new year, Creating the Future. And please share the podcast with your friends. Thank you for being part of this. I hope that you enjoy this conversation. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. It's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. This is the revolution. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. Johan, what an absolute pleasure to be sitting here in your living room. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for coming. We've been trying to organize this for a lot of the year a million years yeah. and um, we're doing it the last possible day before Christmas yeah <laughs> and one of the reasons why it took 
a bit of time was because you spent the summer without a phone or the internet, um, really having some time without social media and all of these distractions. Not many of us are brave enough to do that. Can you tell us what it's like? <laughs> so I'm going to write about this, so I'm not meant to talk about it too much, but it was, uh, and I haven't really formulated my, my thoughts on it. It's part of, I've been trying to think about these issues more, more deeply, but yes, yeah, so I went to a place called Provincetown, which is at the tip of Cape Cod. I've got a friend who, who lives there uh, and I went there last year and I just love it. So I went and I had, I left my smartphone in Boston. So it's across the bay from Boston. I borrowed from my friend Imtiaz a laptop that cannot access the internet. It's that massive, bulky, um, ancient looking laptop there. And I had a massive pile of books and I rented a little kind of beach house. And I had, I did not look at the internet for three months, which is I think the longest I'd gone since the year 2000 or something was like a week. (laughs) And suddenly I had three months. The first week was awful I felt almost like physical withdrawal like irritation like I was missing out on everything and then I had a month that was absolutely blissful and I just wrote every day and I read loads of books and I read War and Peace and I read Great Expectations and I, you know <laughs> and like and, I, and it's, it's a little kind of gay it's a kind of famously gay town and I just kind of spent a time with like talking to really nice people and then about a month in I suddenly felt awful again I felt I suddenly felt essentially if you I think like with all addiction and I think we're all not all of us most of us are would reasonably describe as internet addicted like with all addictions after the initial euphoria of release from the addictive behavior you begin to see the hole that the addiction was filling you clear away the distractions and you begin to see oh okay well what am I what is this frenetic kind of internet behavior what is that a distraction from? And I don't think I'm, I think I'm average for internet addiction. I don't think I'm just particularly off the scale. I think I had periods in my life where I would have been much worse. So then I had a, a month where I actually felt really bad, like quite down. And then I had a kind of recalibration. Where I th- thought again about, okay, well, how do you reconnect with the sources of meaning? What are the things you actually value? And then I had a month where I felt neither euphoric nor miserable, but kind of calm and productive. And then I came back <laughs> and I've been kind of, actually, I didn't come back. I, I, from there, I had to go to New Zealand and Australia uh, to do some um, promotion of my book. And then I, since then, I've been in Florida and um, Los Angeles and um, Brazil. And I, I, so I've been all over the place and my brain's a little bit scrambled and I'm very happy to be back in Britain. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting experiment. And I'm trying to do, at some point in the future, and it'll probably be a few years from now, I'm going to write a book about our attention crisis, why so many of us find it hard to pay attention, whether it's our children, us as adults, and the whole society. So when I write a book, I tend to just do lots of kind of preliminary research, which is just talking to loads of people in the field and just having lots of early conversations and seeing what seems important and interesting to me. So this was part of that very early kind of research for that book, but it'll take absolutely ages. Mm Mm-hmm. It's nice that you take so long and you go so deep with your research. To me, the only value of books, well, not the only value, that's overstating it, but the, the core value, Naomi Klein, who I know you really admire and I do as well, that um, said to me once that, you know, writing a book, asking someone to read your book is like asking them to go on vacation with you. If someone reads your book, you know, my books are kind of medium length, they're like 300 pages, that's asking someone to spend a couple of weeks in your company. To me, if you're asking someone to spend a couple of weeks with you, you've really got to have something interesting and important to say, or something that you believe is interesting and important. So, yeah, for my books, I, I and I'm extraordinarily privileged that I am able to do this. Yeah, my book, for me, the best way to, and this isn't true of all books, there are loads of books much better than mine that are, have very different ways of thinking about it, but for me, the best way to go on an intellectual journey is to go on a physical journey. So for my book, Chasing the Screen, which was about the war on drugs and and addiction, you know, I went on this 30,000 mile journey all over the world. I wanted to go to the places that had the most compassionate policies towards addiction, places that had the most harsh and aggressive policies. Just, I wanted to sit with just an extraordinary, I got to know an incredible array of people who really changed my life. I always think, you know, that 
I, I recently had someone who's gone off on a long travel thing and she said, oh, I want to find myself. And I said, no, the best journeys aren't where you find yourself. The best journey is where you find other people, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually think the journey for yourself is a, is a terrible error. Actually, we can talk about why if you want. Trying to discover yourself as a unique individual is is part of why we're so depressed and anxious and addicted as a society, I think. Yeah, so, and, and with my, my depression book, which was called Lost Connections, um, which is about why we're having such a big epidemic of depression and anxiety and what we can actually do about it. Again, I went on a big journey and partly that was to meet the leading experts all over the world, but also it was just very different places from, you know, a city in Brazil that banned advertising to see if that would make us feel better to a an Amish community because the Amish have very low levels of depression to a housing project in Berlin that really changed my life. I think that where they did something incredible. To, so there's a whole array of places. And to me, it's that thing about to have something valuable to say, you've got to have gone on a journey. And for some people that's an inner journey or a historical journey or into the archives or whatever, and you've got to have found something that, to you at least, and it's not that I discovered made new scientific discoveries, I didn't, but these were things I didn't know, and I like to think of myself as a very well-informed person. So I, I work on the assumption that other people, a lot of other people don't know these things. To me, that's, that's, that's the heart of it. It's got to be a deep journey. And sometimes I have ideas for books, and I uh, do some early research, and I think, I don't have anything new to say about this. I think someone else has written that book as well as, as well, if not usually better than I could. The world doesn't need that. I mean, it's slightly <laughs> pompous and arrogant thing to think the world needs it, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't feel it would make any great contribution for me to try to just redo that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a very, um, that's a very long winded answer to your question. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to pull back to that thing about finding yourself because I wonder if actually the notion of finding yourself, Maybe it's turned into finding this like unique, individualized, you know, your purpose and what makes you alive and all of these kind of things that that you get sold if you're going on a journey to find yourself. But I wonder if the the self that we're looking for is actually that part of ourself that's the same that we all have, that speaks to that same that same part of everyone else. And so I can kind of see how in a way that's a journey inwards but then also if you can find that through other people then that's a beautiful way to do it i think that's a really important thing you just said if we think of the self as a social self right we exist in a community then finding yourself through a community is absolutely not just a good thing but an essential thing to be a happy and fulfilled human being i think too often in our culture finding yourself has been defined in a very different way. So there's two things, I guess, to explain that, I would uh, tell you two about one story and one piece of research, if that's okay. So in Lost Connections, I tell the story of this place that I kept going to. It had this really profound effect on me. It's a place called Cotty. It's in it's in Berlin. Mm, and, I enjoyed um, this in the book. Oh, thank you. The, the, so I guess to tell that story briefly, in, in 2011, um, a Turkish-German woman called Nuria Cengiz uh, put a sign in her window. She lived on a big anonymous housing project and the sign said something like, I got a notice I'm going to be saying I'm going to be evicted from my apartment next Thursday, so next Wednesday night I'm going to kill myself. And this is a housing project. It's, it's in a kind of slightly funny place. When they built the wall in 1963, or sorry, 1961, they obviously built it really quickly and it was thrown up pretty haphazardly. And Cotty, this area was if you look at a map of it it's like it looks like the kind of tooth of west berlin jutting into east berlin right so it was the it was the western side of the wall but it was like a jagged line going into east berlin so if the soviets had invaded this would have been the front line so no one wanted to live there so it basically ended up being inhabited by three groups of people recent muslim immigrants people like nuria she was from turkey gay men and uh, punk squatters and as you can imagine, these three groups looked at each other with quite a lot of mutual incomprehension. And, and this housing project was this kind of, you know, the, the, these, yeah, th- these very divided groups. No one really knew anyone. It was a very big anonymous housing project. But people saw this sign in Nuria's window. She lived on the ground floor. And people started to knock on her door and say, look, are you okay? Do you need any help? And at first, Nuria said, no, fuck off. I don't want any help. She would close the door in their faces. But people standing outside um, 
started to have conversations about this. They were all pissed off because everyone's rent was going up uncontrollably, as it had been in most of Berlin at that time. And, um, you know, lots of people were being evicted. And a few of them, this you might remember this was the, the Arab Spring was happening, the revolution in, in, in Tahrir Square had begun. And some of them had seen this on the news and suddenly one of them had an idea. There's a big thoroughfare that goes through this housing project into the centre of Berlin. And one of them said, you know, if we just blocked the road for a day and we wheel Nuri out and we have a protest, there'll probably be some media interest. There'll be a fuss. They'll probably let Nuria stay in her flat. Maybe there'll be a bit of pressure to keep our rents down. So getting together, loads of people who live there said, okay, well, we'll just do it. We'll just do it. So they blocked the road. They barricaded it. And they go to Nuria and she's like, well, I'm going to kill myself anyway. I may as well let them wheel me out into the middle of the road. She's wheeled out into the middle of the road and the media did come and slightly bemused Nuria is interviewed by the camera crews. And it gets to the end of the day and the police said, okay, you've had your fun, take it down. And the people who live there said, well, hang on a minute. You haven't, you haven't told Nuria she gets to stay. Actually, we want a guarantee that everyone here will have our rent freezed. So when we get that, then we'll take this barricade down. But of course, they knew that the minute they left the barricade, the police would just tear it down anyway. So one of the people there, a woman called Tanya Gartner, who's one of the punk squatters, had this idea. I love Tanya. <laughs> one of them had an idea. She, um, she said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to drop a timetable to man this barricade. Uh, we're going to man it 24 hours a day, and I've got a klaxon in my apartment. I'm going to bring it down. If the police come to take it down, let off the klaxon and we'll all come down from our apartments and we'll all stop them, right? Mm -hmm. So people start to sign up to man this barricade, people who would never have met, right? Nuria, who's a very religious Muslim in a full hijab, get got paired with Tanya, who wears tiny mini skirts even in Berlin winters, right? Um, <laughs> and they got, I forget which night they got, they got the night shift one night. And the first night they sat there, they're like, we've got nothing to talk about. This is a disaster. This is an embarrassment, right? And they just stood. But as the weeks went on, they, they started to talk. They started to get to know each other. And they discovered they had something incredibly powerful in common. Nuria actually told Tanya something she'd, she'd never told anyone in, in Germany. So she had come to Koti when she was 16 years old with her two children from a little village in Turkey. And her job was to raise enough money to working to send back for her husband who stayed behind in Turkey. And after she'd been there for a year and a half, she got word from home that her husband had died. And she told everyone in Germany he'd died of a heart attack. She told Tanya sitting there in the cold in, in Cotty one night that that wasn't true. He'd actually died of tuberculosis, which was seen as like a shameful disease of poverty at the time. That's when Tanya told Nuria something she didn't normally talk about. She'd grown up in a middle class family and she loved punk and she actually got thrown out by her family when she was 15. And she'd made her way to Cotty. She lived in a squat and not soon after and pretty soon afterwards she got pregnant. And she'd been kind of on her own with this child. And they realised they'd both been children with children of their own in this place they didn't understand. These people who looked really different had actually been really similar. And all over Cotty, these pairings were, were happening. There was a young lad called Mehmet who kept being nearly thrown out of school. He's a Turkish-German lad, kept being nearly thrown out of school. They said he had ADHD. He got paired with this crum gr super grumpy old white German guy who um, said he didn't believe in direct action because he loved Stalin, but in this case he would make an exception. And they started, just while they sat there together, this old white guy started helping Mehmet with his homework and he started doing much better at school. These pranks were happening all over the all over Cotton. Um, directly opposite this housing project, there's a gay club called Zudblock, which is run by a man I love called Richard Stein, who... Um, to give you a, it's, it's a really uncompromising gay club. It opened two years before the protest began. And to give you a sense of what they're like, the previous place that Rickard ran was called Cafe Anal. All right. And when this opened, as you can imagine, there's a lot of religious Muslims in this neighbourhood. People had actually smashed the windows and quite a lot of resistance to this gay club. When the protest began, uh, Zudblock, the gay club, gave all their furniture to the, to the, the protest. And they started giving them food and drinks free. And after a while... You probably been going on for about three or four months. He said, you know, you could have your meetings in our club if you want, and we'll give you drinks and everything. Even the lefties at Cotty were like, look, we're not going to get these very religious Muslims to come and have meetings underneath posters for like fisting night. It's not going to happen. But it did happen. And I remember one of the, the Muslim women there saying to me, we all realised we had to take these small steps 
to get to understand each other. And after the protests had been going on for about a year, and by that time they'd literally built a permanent barricade in the street, right? It's a permanent building, because loads of the people there were construction workers. A guy turned up at the protest called Tung Kai, who was in his early 50s. And Tung Kai, when you meet him, has obvious kind of uh, cognitive difficulties. But, and he'd been living homeless. But he has a lovely energy about him, and people immediately liked him. And he started helping them out. And after a few weeks, they said, look, we don't want you to be homeless. You should come and live in this thing we built, right? Because it's a nice big structure. So he started living there and it became, much, it became a much, but he united everyone, the Muslims, the gays, the punks. After Tunkai had been there for, I think it was nine months, one day the police came to inspect. They would do this every now and then. Police came to inspect. And Tunkai doesn't like it when people argue. He thought they were arguing. So he went to hug one of the police officers and they thought he was attacking them. So they arrested him. That was when it was discovered that Tung Kai had been shut away in a mental hospital, literally in a padded cell a lot of the time, for 20 years. And one day he had escaped. He'd had done the streets for a few months and he found his way to Kotti. So the police took him back to this psychiatric hospital uh, and he shut away again. At which point the entire Kotti housing project turned into a free Tung Kai movement, right? Mm -hmm. They descend on this psychiatric hospital at the other side of Berlin. And the psychiatrists there are like, what is this? They've got all these <laughs> women in hijabs, these very camp gay men and these punks demanding the release of this person they've had shut away for, for 20 years. They're completely baffled by it. But I remember Uli, Uli Hartman, one of the protesters saying to them, you know, but you don't love him. He doesn't belong with you. He belongs with us. Anyway, many things happened at Kotti. Obviously, I talk about them in the book, but they got Tunkai back. It took a while. He lives there now. I guess the obvious headline is they got a rent freeze for their entire housing project. They then launched a referendum to keep rents down across the city. They got the largest number of written signatures in the history of the city of Berlin. But I remember the last time I saw Nuria, she said to me, you know, um, I'm really glad I got to stay in my, my neighbourhood. I gained so much more than that. I was surrounded by these incredible people all along and I never knew. Mm. And one of the other... Turkish German woman there, Nereman, said something that's absolutely was transformative for me. She said, you know, she told me, you know, when I grew up in Turkey, I grew up in a village and I called my whole village home. And then I came to live in, in Berlin and I learned that in the West, Western world, what you're meant to call home is just your four walls. And if you're lucky, your family. And then this whole protest began and I started to call this whole place and all these people my home. And she said she realised, in some sense, in this culture, we are homeless. There's a, a Bosnian writer, Alexander Heyman, who said, home is where people notice when you're not there. Using that criteria, most of those people were homeless. And the reason I say that in response to what you were asking, because it goes to me the heart about the, what we get wrong about individualism. What struck me so powerfully in, in Cotty was, you know, the, the core crisis at Cotty, there was a financial crisis, of course. But the core crisis is that they were alone. They didn't need to be drugged. They didn't need to be pathologized. They didn't need to buy more stuff. They needed to be together. And that was just beneath the surface, that insight for everyone. That, that, was, that was so so clear to them and so deep. So I think you're right. Everyone in Cotty went on a journey of self-discovery, but the self they discovered was that they belonged together right? Mm. If they had remained isolated, could they have gone on a journey of self-discovery? Well, I suppose they could have found, you can look within yourself and find something. But to me, what the discovery, the, the self makes no sense if you are an isolated individual, right? This is the core mistake of Western culture. We, we think that yourself, you as an isolated person, is what you really are, and the rest is an addition. But that's not true. Think about how we evolved as a species. I spent a lot of time for my book, Lost Connections, talking to Professor John Cassiopo, who was the leading expert in the world at, on loneliness. He was a professor at University of Chicago. Sadly, he subsequently died, but the who did all this amazing research and he explained to me, why do we exist, right? One of the key reasons why we exist is because our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. They usually weren't bigger than the animals they took down. They weren't faster than the animals they took down. They were much better at banding together into a group and cooperating, right? That was why we survived. Uh, a species of individualists would have died, we wouldn't exist. It would have died out, right? Species of people who behave like neoliberals or like 
Ayn Rand characters would have died and we would not be sitting here. That Just like bees need a hive, humans need a tribe. And, and to talk about, it's like saying to a bee, go on your journey of self-discovery alone, right? I mean, it would be nonsense. The bee only makes sense in the context of the hive. In fact, there's a reason why Robinson Crusoe is, in fact, a nightmare story. And when we read about children who are raised in isolation, like Caspar Hauser or what's the girl who was discovered chained in Nell in, in California in the 70s, a girl who was discovered chained in her basement, she'd been deprived of all human contact. Those aren't heroic stories. Those people are unbelievably impaired They've had nightmare stories that there's a reason why the worst form of torture is solitary confinement, right? We are fundamentally social. The self makes sense only in a social context. And yet that's not how we're encouraged to think of ourselves in this culture. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And yeah, I'm really with you on this notion of this Western idea of the self being dangerous, actually. I think that there are still some things to gain from an Eastern idea of the self and how journeys inwards through meditation and these kind of things can give you more tools, but those tools only become useful when they're then uh, used with other people and in, in community. I think that's a brilliant way of putting it. That's exactly right. It's why the kind of meditation I'm most drawn to is loving kindness meditation, which is all about helping you then connect with other, with other people. But, As you were saying that, I was thinking it's a sign of how misguided this culture has become on these questions. You think about the most banal cliche we say in our culture is when someone feels down, we say, be you, be yourself, right? It's a sign of how misguided the culture has become that even our banal cliches are wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, if you're down, just being you is not going to help you. Be us, be the group. Nuria in Cotty did not need to be you. She needed to be part of the group, right? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you can go too far the other way and you can have societies where people are accorded no individualism and yet we don't want to get into a kind of false, um, you know, you don't want to be purely the collective. Of course, you need some sense of distinctive individual autonomy. But there's a good study that I think illustrates what you're saying. There's a woman I interviewed, a fascinating person called Dr. Brett Ford, who, when I interviewed her, was at Berkeley in California. She's in Toronto now. Who did this really interesting study with her colleagues. So they wanted to study... If an individual decides they are consciously going to try to be happier, they're going to make an effort to try to be happier, will they actually become happier? So let's say one of your listeners said, I'm going to spend two hours a day trying to make me happy. Would it work? And they did this study in four countries with big teams in them. It was in the United States, in um, Japan, Russia, and Taiwan. And what they found at first seems to make no sense. In the United States, If you try to make yourself happier, you do not become happier. In the other societies, if you try to make yourself become happier, you do. And at first they're like, how can that be? What's going on here? So they did a bit more research and what they discovered is in the United States, and I'm pretty sure this would be true in Europe as well, although, and I'm still counting us in Europe for a few more weeks, um, (laughs) although I think to a somewhat lesser degree than the United States, in the US, if you try to make yourself happier, you do something for yourself in general. You buy something, you show it off on Instagram, you treat yourself, all of those things. In the other countries, in general, of course, there are exceptions on both sides. If you try to make yourself happier, you generally do something for someone else, for your friends, your family, your community. So Americans and us, I think, how, although we were not covered in the study, have an instinctively individualistic idea of what happiness is. And they have an instinctively collective idea of what happiness is. And it turns out our story of happiness just doesn't work. As I say, that a group of people with that theory of happiness would have died out, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, 10,000 years ago. I think you're, you're certainly right that there are tools about introspection, that introspection can help you to dismantle the barriers within yourself to being part of the group. But there's another conception of introspection, which is more, if we think not of the image of the yogi, but the image of the cowboy, right? Which is such a powerful archetype in American culture such a, and Western culture more generally, cowboy, and this is a myth, by the way, actual cowboys were not like this. But, right, because the, they the, wouldn't survive if they exactly, were. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's ludicrous, right? The, but but the, the myth of the cowboy, I always think actually there's a really interesting thing about, there's a biography recently of, um, I didn't read it, I read the, um, it was a very good piece in The Atlantic about this. Uh, I, I loved those movies when I was a kid, like uh, John Ford movies, like Stagecoach. It's very interesting. If you look at the myth of the cowboy, 
as it is most popularised in the 20th century through John Ford movies, actually, John Ford was an incredibly unhappy, bitterly repressed gay man who really wanted to fuck John, John Wayne, who was not gay. And he would horrendously bully John Wayne on the sets of these movies. He would literally slap him across the face. John Wayne would cry. John Wayne was completely broken during the making of these films. Uh, John Wayne himself was actually a rather effeminate person. His original name had been Marion. He'd been teased a lot. And I always think, God, this, this image of cowboy masculinity is created by these two deeply fucked up, miserable people who were crying all the time, right? It, I think that tells you something about the debate about masculinity, when you actually look at the avatars, the avatars, not the right word, the, well, it might be for John Wayne, but the ultimate expressions of these forms of masculinity, they're unbelievably, Donald Trump is another example, right? They're unbelievably unhappy. This is, it's, it's a prison created by unhappy people that makes everyone unhappy. And it's one of the expressions of this kind of extreme individualism. It's, an, it's, it, it's the, it's one expression of a deeper underlying logic of individualism, which is, is a disaster for all of us. Yeah, totally. And there's like, I guess this pick and choose individualist mentality that we have with each other. Like, I know that when I've been in periods of depression, you know, a lot of people just don't want to hang out with me. I mean, why would they? Because I'm miserable. And But when I'm in like a phase where I'm, you know, really full of energy, then of course your friends your invitations triple and the people that show up as your community like quadruple and there's a whole kind of sense of yeah you you're you're in it it's very hard to find people that want to sit with each other in the darkness or want to accept people in those spaces and so it becomes this lonely isolating thing and we're so disposable around people in that way in our culture. I think the story of Tunkai really illustrates that, that here is somebody that for 20 years was locked away in a mental institute, written off, and by the love of a community and the acceptance and the non-judgment and the giving of responsibility and the sharing, he became somebody else, you know? And you see that totally with Tunkai. When you're there, it's not like... Tunkai is the recipient of charity, right? Yeah. That is absolutely not what happens in Kotick. He is makes a really important contribution, right? He notices people, he hugs them. But if you've just got an, a society of isolated individuals, how would I put it? We have so few... It's a study that asks Americans, how many people know you well? It was done last year, I think. Half of all Americans said nobody. So if you've got such tenuous social connections, I was just doing an interview yesterday because the Lost Connection is coming out in France. You know, I was looking again at the figures in for France, which is quite typical of the Western world, but it, it's just sort of fresh in my memory. One in eight French people have no regular social connections. None. And one third have one social connection, which says there's one person they regularly have a connected social conversation with. I mean, just think about that. That's an extraordinary thing to say about our society and our culture, that we've ended up failing to meet people's needs in the most basic ways. And one of the things I was trying to think about a lot, writing Lost Connections, there's another person who really helped me to understand this, a completely amazing man, a great person for you to interview, actually, because he's a really remarkable person, is... Um, a man called Professor Tim Kasser, who did this, who's done this amazing research over the past 25 years that should be much better. It's pretty well known in the field, but I think it should be much better known. So for thousands of years, philosophers have said, if you think life is about money and status and how you look to other people, you're going to feel like shit, right? That's not exactly how Confucius put it, but that's the gist of what he said. But weirdly, no one had actually scientifically investigated this until Professor Kasser did. Started to do it about 20, a bit more than 25 years ago now. And I think he really made this important breakthrough that we all know that junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick, right? Junk food appeals to the part of us that needs nutrition, but actually poisons us. What's interesting is, a kind of very similarly, a kind of junk values have taken over our minds and made us mentally sick. 
So Professor Kasser was, this was already known before he started his research, but he then made a breakthrough with it. So one part, this, this part I'm about to explain was already known. So every human being is a mixture of two kinds of motivation, right? So imagine if you play the piano, I'm totally unmusical, but you might. If you play the piano in the morning, because it just gives you joy and you love it, or you play it with your kids at night and they sing along, that's an intrinsic reason to play the piano, right? You're not doing that to get anything out of it, that's your end goal. You just love the thing itself. Okay, now imagine you play the piano, not because you love it, but, um, I don't know, in a dive bar to pay the rent, right? Uh, or to impress a man. I don't know some man is really into piano players or something, right? Or because your parents are pressuring you because they really want you to be a piano maestro. That would be an extrinsic reason to play the piano, right? You're not doing it because the experience is the thing you want. You're doing it to get something further down the line out of it. And of course, we're all a mixture of intrinsic and extrinsic motives, right? That's all humans are. But Professor Kasser showed two really important things. As a culture, we have become much more driven by extrinsic motives over time. We're much more driven by how we look to other people in a destructive sense, uh, money, status. He also showed, for me really importantly, the more you are driven by extrinsic motives, the more likely you are to become depressed and anxious by quite a significant amount. And I think because it speaks to exactly what you're, what you're talking about there, which is, th there's many reasons, and I go through in the book some of them, but one is, if you are driven by extrinsic motives, so how you look at other people, how they're ex externally evaluating you, your social and intimate connections will be much more tenuous. So to give you a kind of, uh, this is a slightly cheap example, but it's, yeah, I think, a revealing one. In 2009, Melania Trump went to speak at NYU. I can't imagine why. This is before the politics and everything. A student asked her, would you have married Donald Trump if he wasn't rich? And she said, do you think he would have married me if I wasn't beautiful? Which in some ways is witty, but think about what that tells you about, and by the way, there's a parallel interview with Trump, much cruder and nastier, where he was asked by Howard Stern, the radio host, if Melania was really badly burned in a fire and wasn't beautiful anymore, would you still love her? And Donald Trump's answer was, do her tits get burned? Mm. I know, it's hideous. And But what that tells you, right, that's a very extreme example. Yeah. But think about what that means for the internal life of Donald and Melania Trump. Donald Trump knows if he stops being rich, it's over. Melania Trump knows if she stops being gorgeous, it's over, right? Now, that that's a very extreme example, but what it shows you is we're all become more, we've, or not all of us, but most people have become more like the Trumps. I mean, they're way off at the end of the spectrum, but we've all become closer to that model, which is having relationships based on external valuation rather than there are plenty of criticism of the Obamas, to be sure, and some of the things that Barack Obama did as president, but you compare the relationship of Barack and Michelle Obama, where I'm sure they would say, I would love him even if he was, she would say, I would love him even if he was homeless and he lost everything, and, you know, and he would say the same. And you can see how that would be a more nurturing and sustaining relationship, one that meets a person's underlying psychological needs more. And and just, I, I think, part of, how do I put it, we've, We've told a whole story about happiness. Mm. Partly the individualism, but also partly where do you find happiness? Buy shit, right? The, this is a heartbreaking experiment. It was done in 1976, not by Professor Kasser, but by someone else, a team of psychologists. I think it was in um, Minneapolis, but that could be wrong. It's a really simple little experiment. They get a bunch of five-year-olds and they split them into two groups. And the first group is shown two advertisements for a toy, whatever the equivalent of Dora the Explorer was in 1976. And the second group is shown no advertisements. And then at the end of it, they say to all the kids, okay, kids, you've got a choice now. You can either play with a nasty boy who's got the toy that was in the advertisement, or you can play with a nice boy who doesn't have the toy. And the kids who've seen just two advertisements overwhelmingly choose to play with the nasty boy who's got the toy. And the kids who have not seen the advertisements choose to play with the nice boy who doesn't have the toy. So just two advertisements prime those kids to choose an inanimate lump of plastic over the possibility of love and connection, right? And fun and joy. I think Melania Trump is a good illustration of that yeah. principle taken to its extreme, but the, and Donald Trump, but the, I don't want to single it out on her, but 
we're all exposed. That that story is, you know, more 18-month-old children recognize the McDonald's M than know their own surname, right? We are indoctrinated in these stories. And I'm not dissing McDonald's. I was responsible for at least one of my chins, but... The, the, <laughs> my the, first the, taste of meat <laughs> at the age of 11. Oh, my God, what did you think? I loved it. I was triple dead with a cherry on top to have a bite of a cheeseburger. Oh, my God. And I did. And then I finished it. <laughs> oh, my God. It's, I was... For me, junk food was like a, like a kind of. It's funny. There's a word that came into my head. I don't know why. I was going to say like a womb, but like I, it was one of the primary ways I would comfort myself as a child. I would just, you know, every day just go and eat like horrendous junk food. Yeah, the the. So I have a very deep, <laughs> a very deep affection for that. I, I think I tell the story in the book of them. Um, a low point for me with junk food, which was. Um, Christmas, if so, it was almost exactly, what are we now, 2018, exactly, um, so 2009, nine years ago, nine years ago in two days, in fact, God, I hadn't thought of that, um, I went to my local KFC, which was, it was lunchtime, I went to my local KFC, which is um, the one at the end of Brick Lane in East London, and um, I went in and I said my order, which was so disgusting, I won't repeat it, and um, <laughs> the guy behind the counter said, oh, Johan, I'm so glad you're here, and I was like, all right, and he said, just wait a minute. And he went back behind all the chip fat fries and everything. And he came back with a fucking massive Christmas card in which every member of staff had written to our best customer and they'd all written little personal messages. And my heart sank and I suddenly thought, this isn't even the fried chicken shop I come to the most. Right? That, um, <laughs> and that was where I thought, okay, I need to, there's something, I've got a problem here, right? But um, but yeah, so I, this is the thing that... Wait, when did you have your last fried chicken? Oh, like... Four days ago, but then I didn't go complete cold turkey. But there, but no, but I massively cut back. But um, it's all about balance. Yeah, and I think it's also important to say that these artificial constructs are things that people will then attach genuine emotional feeling to, right? Mm -hmm. And that emotional, like for example, I was thinking about this recently because I went back to where I grew, I grew up in Edgware in North London at the end of the Northern Line. There's a shitty, ratty little shopping centre called the Boardwalk Centre in Edgware. And I went there and felt really emotional. I hadn't been there in 10 years. And you can't imagine a more artificial environment than the boardwalk centre, right? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. it's as artificial as a human thing can be. And yeah, I felt emotional going there. Because people will develop real emotion around these artificial and in some ways quite inhuman environments. And that emotion is real. And that's not an emotion to be ridiculed or, or patronised, right? And I think there can be sometimes outside of this debate can kind of act as though these emotional attachments are somehow, how to put it, somehow contemptible or foolish. And I don't think that's the case, right? I don't, I don't think that's the right way of thinking about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, totally, because we're, we're all in this society together. And so to look down on each other for having grown up in certain ways and got used to certain things and kind of judge each other for it like that feels really unhelpful even more than that i was just saying i've been thinking about a lot over the last few years as everyone has but you know we're in the middle of this 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 really substantial crisis in western democracy and i i spent most of my time in the us and i was in the us in the run-up to the election of Trump, which I was one of the very few people among my friends, I was quite confident he was going to win. I didn't, wasn't confident Brexit would pass, but I was quite confident Trump was going to win. And I had this moment in particular that really uh, has haunted me. I was in Cleveland in, in Ohio, shortly before the election, with a, an amazing group that I'm going to write about for a future book for something else, a completely different subject. The LA LGBT Centre do this really interesting deep canvassing work where they um, try to alter people's opinions over time. And anyway, I won't go into the details of that, but I was, because it's not relevant to this, but I was on this street in, in, in West Cleveland uh, in a place called Slavic City with a guy called Dave Fleischer, who's a great guy. And we were knocking on doors and we were on this street where a third of the houses had been demolished a third still have a, th a third were still standing but were abandoned and a third still have people living in them often literally behind barbed wire and we're going down the street and we're trying to persuade people to vote and we knocked on this door and there's a woman who answered who 
I would have guessed from looking at her was 60. Discovered from talking to her, she was the same age as me. I was at that time 37 or 38. And she was quite articulate. She was extremely angry. There's no way she was going to vote for Hillary. And um, she was kind of raging. And she made this verbal mistake that's really stayed with me. She was talking about what the area used to be like for her parents and grandparents. She meant to say, so she was talking about how when they left school, they, you know, they, they left school at 16, they got decent jobs, they had reasonable lives. And she meant to say, when I was young, what she actually said is when I was alive. Mm. And it, she didn't even pick up on the fact that she'd made this slip and it really stayed with me. That's how a lot of people feel in this culture, right? And they're not wrong. They've been deprived. You know, everyone knows they have natural physical needs for food and water and shelter. But there's equal evidence, equally strong evidence that everyone has natural psychological needs, right? You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And the culture we have is good at lots of things. I'm really glad to have dentistry and gay marriage and all sorts of fantastic things. It's not about rubbishing this culture. This is a really good culture in many ways. But it's not a culture that meets people's basic psychological needs in many, many cases. And the reason I relate that to what you're asking is because I just think it's such a disaster that our response to this ra- frightening rage and this rise of fascistic um, leaders and political movements is to scorn and show contempt for people like that woman, right? Mm-hmm. The I was just in Brazil where they've elected a person who's even more horrifying than Trump. In fact, someone who, much as I hate Trump, this guy Jair Bolsonaro makes Trump look like Oprah. I mean, he's a, it's horrendous. And and I have some, I have significant anger for the people who voted for, including some of my relatives who voted for Brexit and, and Trump and, and, and Bolsonaro. But so I'm not condemning people who are angry. People are right to be angry. This is a horrifying and terrible moment that is harming huge numbers of people. And people who voted for Trump willfully, they, it's not they didn't know that he was a racist. No, he'd said Mexicans were rapists and all these things. They chose to set that aside. And I, I am critical of them for that. But they did that in a context, which is a terrible context. And not just a terrible context for poor people. It's not true that, yeah, I mean, so Trump voters were slightly wealthier than the average American. So we don't want to get that wrong. But the on average... So much of our discourse, and a lot of this is driven by social media, is a shame and humiliation based discourse. So I'll give you an example of something that I think is actually the more defensible end of this. But a few weeks ago, there's a kind of football hooligan type person called Tommy Robinson, who your British listeners will know who that is, but most Americans and other people won't. So he's a, a guy who grew up in Luton, which is a town very divided between um, kind of white uh, people and uh, people who descended from immigrants from South, you know, from, from India and, and other parts of the world, uh, and Pakistan and Bangladesh. And it's a very divided town. There's a lot of ugliness going on there, although a lot of great things happening in Luton as well. I've got relatives who, who live there. And um, Tommy Robinson has become a kind of uh, figure kind of far-right figure advocating open racism. It's not quite like Richard Spencer, but Americans want a kind of approximate comparison. Richard Spencer would be a good comparison. And he organised a march in London uh, two weeks ago, or thereabouts, where like a few thousand people turned out and there were 15,000 counter-protesters who really drowned out the the kind of far-right protest. That's exactly how it should be, right? These people have a right to protest and we want to show there's far more of us than there are of them, right? And he really says revolting things like the Muslim mayor of London, who's a fantastic mayor, Sadiq Khan. Tommy Robinson says he's part of it and couldn't be more British, right? He's from Tooting. He said something like, you know, Sadiq Khan is part of a Muslim invasion. I mean, just really revolting things. And that he's not British and just grotesque things. That's that's all to the good that there was a big protest. But that night, someone I like and admire, I won't say who because I don't want to sound like I'm slagging this person off, Someone I like and admire tweeted something like, I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't want people to figure out who it is, but something like, uh, Tommy Robinson has been totally humiliated today. And if I was Tommy Robinson, I'd never show my face in public again. 
And that's the more defensible end of one of this anger and shame based way of discourse, because Tommy Robinson really is a terribly is doing terrible harm, right? Terrible harm. And is part of a really ugly movement. But I saw that and I just thought, I used to engage in politics in this way. I never want to engage in politics. I don't want Tommy Robinson to be humiliated. I want him to change, right? Now, this person, I'm sure, the person I'm talking about, I'm sure would say, well, he also wants Tommy Robinson to change and this is part of changing him. And But I just think so much of our discourse has become driven by this desire to be like, I'm the humi... You no, know, you're the humiliated one, right? Mm-hmm. It's such to say to everyone else, no, I'm not humiliated, you're humiliated. I remember even it made me think about, again, a very admirable movement, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about most of this movement then, but do you remember a good while ago now, maybe six years ago, there was um, a spate of suicides by young gay people in the United States. And my friend Dan Savage, who's an amazing person, heroic person, set up a campaign called It Gets Better, where people recorded messages, mostly gay people and trans people and other other people, part of the LGBT world, recorded messages to young young people just saying, I've been where you are, it's, it was really tough, but it will get better, right? And most of these videos were fantastic and, and heroic, and Dan's was amazing. And But there was an undercurrent in a lot of those videos that, I want to be clear, not Dan's and not most of them, but that really disconcerted me. Because a significant number of them, because lots of just a kind of non-celebrity people recorded their own. So we're undercurrent where a significant number said something like, Hi, uh, you know, I was in your position. I was really bullied and beaten up. But now the people who did that bullying, they're the people washing my car, right? And they're, or they're, you know, I got to, I get to go and have a big fancy life and they're still in that shitty small town and they're scum, right? Mm. I remember watching that and thinking, oh no, this is exactly what we don't, you're still in the bully, bullied dynamic. It's just you're saying, don't worry, kid, one day you'll get to be the bully, right? And I understand why they're like that. And I want to approach that with spirit of love and compassion. But I thought, this is not what we want to be. We don't want, we want to be saying, well, firstly, it's not a humiliation to be cleaning someone's car. That's a useful job. And it's not a humiliation to be a mechanic in a garage or none of these things are humiliations. But it'll be humiliating working class people. But also, that's so bad for the person saying it. That's such a internal form of violence against yourself, right? I don't want to be part of, and I have been at earlier points in my life for sure. I was a newspaper columnist for many years, engaged in a lot of this kind of more aggressive discourse. I just don't want to be engaging with the world in that tone. Now, this is not to say there are not people who have to be stopped. Tommy Robinson has to be stopped. Donald Trump has to be stopped. I really hope we can still stop Brexit, although I'm starting to doubt it. There are plenty of people who have to be stopped, but there's no one who has to be hated. And there's no one who has to be, there are people who have to be stopped from what they're doing, but they don't have to be humiliated. And that's not what we want. That, 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 that's, that's partly because that's bad for them and they're still people, but it's also bad for us to want to humiliate someone else. And I understand it's partly because like this person who did this tweet about Tommy Robinson, who is again, is stressed as someone I admire and like and have known for years, is him himself soaking up a huge amount of humiliation all the time. Yeah. Right? Because you're constantly getting all this aggression on social media. You're constantly being happy, mocking you and humiliating you. And that's just dreadful damage to the, almost the, 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 the structure and character of your consciousness to be soaking up humiliation all the time. You will inevitably try to expel some of that energy by trying to transfer it onto other people. No, like, you know, like the bit at the yeah. end of George Orwell's novel, 1984, no, do it to her, don't do it to me. But, but that's that's not the answer. Does that make sense or does that sound totally. I just know, too pious? Well, I was going to ask, I was going to ask really like how much of this instinct to blame and shame others is our inability to sit with our own shame and, you know, the parts of ourselves that society or our culture has deemed unacceptable. And so because of that relationship, then of course, when we witness something in other people that we we don't think is savory, then that part of us gets activated. And I feel like we're, you know, we're in a place where having the good guys and the bad guys, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't work because we're all disconnected and 
that's why we're making certain decisions or we're we're doing certain things or we're putting forward certain policies and so how is it that we can find our way back to that connection and you know even just this notion of this person has to change it still feels quite violent you know what about an invitation a, a, inviting space for that change to happen I'm quite interested in in that I think where my work brings together you know these these more kind of inner aspects of ourselves with the outer aspects of what's going on this this is a place where I'm quite interested in where they meet and I'm working on a book at the moment um, which is about this obsession that that we have culturally I and mean, I'm writing this book for women but it's it's not just relevant for women but with our image and with what we're putting out there and then of course what that's creating in the world around how things are being made and how much we're consuming and how much is going into landfill but also how affected we are by all the advertising like you were saying with these kids and the toy and so understanding that that's where we are you know, that we're receiving all these messages constantly from the magazines, from each other, from our Instagram feeds and understanding that that's going to have a profound impact on our whole mental structure and therefore will drive us to focus on, you know, buying the latest this or, you know, almost like as armour to protect ourselves. So I'm, I'm working on a book about that at the moment and I'm, I'm interested in this relationship with our self-worth and if we can kind of understand that that's the cycle that we're in, it's not about then being ashamed that we're in that cycle. I mean, I was a, you know, I had so many handbags and pair of high heels. I grew up in Derby, you know. It was like, it was definitely, a, you know, that was what becoming a, a woman, I mean, I was a teenager, but I thought I was becoming a woman, like what that meant, you know, to have all of these things. And... I still can enjoy a handbag. I mean, I wouldn't spend so much on it. This this handbag is... It's lovely, actually. I commented on it when you came this in. This yeah. is made from um, factory rags in a garment factory in India. Really? And a woman that worked there collected all the rags and then she wow. made it. And then, you know, now she's selling them. And so I look for things with these kind of stories. But I think that rather than, you know, like shaming, you know, Kim Kardashian, da 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 I mean, Kim Kardashian actually seems really nice, like when you hear her speak. Mm. And it's just that these values are quite different. Um, and so I'm interested in what happens if we can break beyond those values and also allow ourselves to nurture in each other some of the qualities that haven't been given importance, such as intuition, for example. You're so right. There's this person I interviewed for my for Lost Connections who I, I thought about a lot. He So he worked with Professor Tim Casser, who did all that research about junk values. This guy called Nathan Dunger, and his story's kind of interesting. So Nathan um, was and is a financial advisor in Minneapolis. And he was called in by a local school. So there were these schools, they were kind of middle-class schools. They weren't rich kids, but they weren't poor either. And the school was having a real problem that these kids were becoming obsessed with designer things like Nike sneakers. And they were getting genuinely really distressed if they didn't get them, right? And the parents were really struggling to provide these, like... And they called him in, and part of his job was to advise on things like budgeting. So they're like, will you come in and explain budgeting to these kids? So he comes in and talks about budgeting, and he very quickly realises there's something very different going on here that the, that just explaining, you know, money going in and money going out is not going to solve this problem. So he teamed up with Professor Kassa and they did this, this experiment that I found really fascinating. So it was from these schools, they got teenagers and their parents and it was an experiment to see if you can measurably move people's values. So they met once every two weeks for I think about four or five or six months, I forget exactly the details in the book. And the first meetings were just about, okay, write down the things you've got to have. And of course, people would say like housing and you know food and things. But quite quickly, the teenagers would say Nike sneakers. The mother would say, you know, uh, or the father would say, you name something expensive like a fancy iPad or a designer bag or whatever. 
and they would talk about well, what will change if you get that thing? What what will be different in your life if you get those Nike sneakers or that fancy handbag? And quite quickly, people would say things like, it wasn't an inherent property of the, the thing they craved. It was like, well, I will be accepted by the group. People will envy me or whatever it would be. And it doesn't take long to get people to say that out loud before they go, oh, what? Is there some other way I could get that? Why, why do I think I'll be accepted by the group if I've got this? Why do I want to be envied? And it led to these very searching conversations about advertising, about how our values are constructed. But then the next stage was, okay, would, it partly was about deconstructing the junk values. And then they would start to about, what do you actually think is important in life? What is really meaningful? And people would talk about their families. They talk about something they love, like playing a musical instrument or, you know, writing songs or walking in the mountains. And they would have these, these are the kind of conversations we, don't, we very rarely have in this culture. And then they would say, well, how could you build more of those genuinely meaningful things into your life? And they would report back, it's like a kind of Weight Watchers or Alcoholics Anonymous for the perils of Western civilization. And what they, what they showed is just meeting once every few weeks, you know, for half a year, led to a really measurable and significant movement in people's values, which we know correlates with lower depression anxiety and so on. And this is the thing, when you explain these things to people, this is not like explaining quantum physics or Chomsky and linguistics, or it's not like explaining some super complex thing. In a way, I feel like, and I really see this, I've been traveling all over the world this year talking to people about my book, and I really see this with audiences. I feel like at some level, I'm giving people permission to know what they already know about themselves. Of course, there's lots of detail they don't know, there's lots of stories they don't know, lots of specific programs that I talk about in the book and specific things people can do they don't know about. But at the heart of it, I feel like I'm just letting, and it's been such an education in both how people know it and how people resist it. So I'll give you an example. I did an interview with a prominent American interviewer where I was talking about what I think is one of the most banal and obvious points in my book, which is the evidence that loneliness causes depression and anxiety. And then I talked about this amazing program that, that massively reduced loneliness. We can talk about if you want. But which one is that? This is the one in, in East London. Sam that, Everett, oh, what a hero. You should interview I Sam. I want to. He's a I really total want to. hero. But, but, so I was talking about how loneliness causes depression. And this interviewer said, well, this is a very controversial theory. And I thought, wow. How did we get to the point where the most banal insight, saying that your grandmother and my grandmother would have thought was so obvious that if someone didn't even ask them about it, which da is regarded as controversial. It's a sign of how deeply divorced we've become from the sources of our own pain. Mm. How you know these because what's happened is with our pain, we've been told these overwhelmingly biological stories, right? Now, there are real biological aspects to depression, anxiety, and addiction, to be sure, and I write about them in the book. But they're part of a much bigger picture. But what we've been told is, so when I was a teenager and I went to my doctor and explained that I had this feeling like pain was leaking out of me, and I didn't understand, my doctor told me an entirely biological story. He said, you just feel this way because you've got a lacking chemical in your brain, the chemical serotonin, which, by the way, is not true. There are real biological factors, but that's not true. And what that did is it divorced me from the sources of my pain, right? From finding those sources, identifying them with people and, and solving them together, right? It, and telling this, you know, biology should be a big part of the story we tell because it's a big part of the what's going on. But to make it mo all, most or in fact all of the story for most people or for many people, is a betrayal, as the World Health Organization has been saying, really lets those people down and it lets the society down. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we haven't even really talked about depression yet in this conversation and talked about you know, the, cru the crux of, of what your book reveals, partly because I feel it is so obvious, you know, we, we know that big pharma has become is an industry we know that it's not you know it's not this um, body that's set up to help us all be really healthy and you know i never went to a doctor with any of my depression because 
I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to have antidepressants. I kind of had a, uh, a little bit of a head start in that I know a lot of psychiatrists. So I grew up around a lot of psychiatrists. And so I, I kind of maybe have more information than, than a lot of people have. But I think this is part of what's amazing about your book is that it's gone out there and it's brought some ideas into the mainstream and it's got things discussed in lots of places that they weren't discussed before. But then the fact that there are still so many people that say, no, but like, you know, this is controversial. And it's kind of interesting that as society, we still have our eyes so closed. Yeah, I mean, it, a funny thing, I think that's partly, so there's, there's several things going on there. So there's a funny thing that happens when you write a book that then gets widely discussed, which is particularly on social media, a kind of shadow book gets created of all the things people think, people who admit they haven't read your book think it says. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of furiously and savagely denounce this shadow book that doesn't really bear much relation to your your actual book. Mm -hmm. So I had this slightly weird experience just after the book came out where so a big extract from the book was in The Guardian and then a, 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 another writer for The Guardian, who, to be fair to him, admitted he hadn't read the book, kind of angrily announced that I was telling everyone to quit antidepressants and this would be a disaster. And the book doesn't say anything of the sort. In fact, it says the opposite. It says that for people who are being helped by antidepressants, my advice is they carry on taking them. But I think the debate about antidepressants, I understand why... So that there's kind of, you set that aside in a sense, the kind of fictional argument that I'm telling people to quit, but... There is a more nuanced argument, and I understand why some people are resistant to that, because I was very resistant to it. So I took chemical antidepressants for 13 years. Uh, Initially, they gave me a big boost, and then over time, I kept jacking up the dose, and over time, I was still severely depressed, and I was experiencing all sorts of horrible side effects, like massive weight gain, which is very common. When I was learning specifically stuff about chemical antidepressants, I think to me, there are there are two insights, two two really important scientific studies about. Well, there's many, but there's two I think that are really particularly important people to know about when it relates to chemical antidepressants. Again, I think uh, the insight is almost banal, so it surprises me that it was so. Even the people who did understand this insight regarded it as controversial. I think I know why. So the first is 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 the research that was done at Harvard Medical School, which looks at so. Depression is measured by something called the Hamilton scale. And to give you a sense of the Hamilton scale, it goes from one where you would be dancing around in ecstasy, maybe on ecstasy, to 51 year where you would be acutely suicidal. And to give you a sense of movement on the Hamilton scale, if you improve your sleep patterns, you will generally gain six points on the Hamilton scale. And if your six point, if your if your sleep patterns deteriorate, like when you have a baby, you'll generally go six points the other way. On average, over time, chemical antidepressants move people 1.8 points on the Hamilton scale. It's about a third of improving your sleep patterns. It's important to say that's an average. So I initially got more over time, I got less. Um, it's important to say, of course, some people will get consistently more, some people will get consistently less. And it's important to say 1.8 points is not nothing, right? That's that's something. If you're about to jump off a bridge, 1.8 points on the Hamilton scale could be the thing that saves your life. But it's also important to say, you can just see that's obviously not going to solve the problem for most people. And the other piece of evidence I think is really important for showing that is this thing called the STAR-D trial, which is the best, lo- shockingly little evidence into the long-term effects of chemical antidepressants. Almost all the studies focus on six to eight weeks. So there was a study in The Lancet, the excellent, it was a good study by an admirable man, Dr. Andrea Cipriani and his, his colleagues who I've talked with, I've talked with him, not his colleagues, which showed what we already knew, but it's worth reiterating it, the chemical antidepressants do give a substantial boost in the first six to eight weeks, right? And it was my experience, and that's the evidence from all the science. But the STAR-D trial is the best long-term research. And what it shows is, it it, it just works in the most simple way, it just follows people who go to their doctor and say, I'm depressed, and who are given help, and it just tracks, are they, do they remain depressed and what happens over time? And the majority of people, and there's debate about what the exact figure is because it's difficult, depends how you define still being depressed, but most people taking chemical antidepressants do become depressed again. It doesn't mean there's no help, it doesn't doesn't mean it doesn't give some relief, it does give some relief. But again, it's not solving the problem. And we can just see this if we look around us. You know, for the last 30 years, every single year we've increased prescriptions of chemical antidepressants. 
and every year depression and anxiety continue to rise. Now, they're not rising because of the chemical antidepressants. They'd be rising even faster if it wasn't because of the chemical antidepressants. But you could, there's a, something missing in that picture, right? Yeah. And that's, I go through in Lost Connections, the nine causes of depression and anxiety, many of which, not all, are rising. But one person really helped me to think differently. It would be another great person for you to interview, a fantastic South African psychiatrist called Dr. Derek Summerfield. He's a great guy. And he, it was this, he told me this story that really helped me to reframe this. So he was in Cambodia in 2001 or 2000 when they first introduced chemical antidepressants in that country for Cambodian people. And the local doctors, the Cambodians, didn't know what these drugs were. So he explained. And they said to him, oh, we don't need them. We've already got antidepressants. And he said, what do you mean? They thought they were going to talk about some kind of herbal remedy like Ginkgo biloba or St. John's wort. Instead, they told him a story. There was a farmer in their community who worked in the rice fields. And one day he got his leg blown off by a landmine left over by the American invasion of Southeast Asia. So they gave him an artificial leg and they helped him and kind of good at that. And after a while, he went back to work in the rice fields. But apparently it's extremely painful to work underwater with an artificial leg. I'm guessing it's traumatic for obvious reasons. The guy started to cry all day, didn't want to get out of bed. He developed classic depression. So they said to Dr. Summerfield, well, that's when we gave him an antidepressant. And Dr. Summerfield said, well, what was it? They explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense. They figured if they bought him a cow, he could become a dairy farmer. He wouldn't be in this position that was causing him so much pain. So they bought him a cow. Within a couple of weeks, his crying stopped. Within a month, his depression was gone. They said to Dr. Summerfield, so you see, doctor, that cow, that was an antidepressant. That's what you mean, right? Now, if you've been raised to think about antidepressants the way we have, that sounds like a joke. I went to my doctor for an antidepressant and gave me a cow. But what those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively is what the leading medical body in the world, the World Health Organization, has been trying to tell us for years now. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not crazy, you're not a machine with broken parts, you're a human being with unmet needs. What you need is to be listened to and valued and held and to be given practical help for how to deal with the things that are in fact making you depressed. That's important. That's not an individualistic thing, right? It's not saying to that guy, hey, buddy, you've got to shape up. You've got to, you've got to solve your problem, right? That guy could not have solved his problem on his own. It's not saying there's no biological component to depression. There is a real biological component that exists alongside the social and psychological factors. But to me, what that led me to think is, and it took me a while to really absorb what he was saying, but well, what's the cow for the things that are making us depressed and anxious, right? What deals with with our depression and anxiety. And in a way, the last third of, of my book, Lost Connections, is really an attempt to, to answer that but uh, and to look at very practical programs that I saw in place all over the world that are that have been shown to reduce depression and anxiety. But, but this is not an argument. I think when anyone reads a book or they hear me, they can see that's not an argument for junking antidepressants, chemical antidepressants entirely. It's saying we need to have a nuanced and honest conversation about this. And I understand why that's threatening because in this, I'm trying to think about it, when, in my own thoughts, in this culture, it's not the only thing you're offered. You're also offered CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, there are some good CBT practitioners, but the theory behind CBT, if you read Aaron Beck, who kind of pioneered this approach, it's very individualistic. It's about the idea that the problem is your thought patterns and you need to change your thought patterns. And there is real value in that, but the evidence shows it's pretty short-lived for most people. I think because most of the problem is not in individual's thought patterns. That guy in that field, that farmer in Cambodia, didn't need to change his thought patterns. He needed a cow. Most of our problems are more analogous to that than they are, which is not to say there's not yeah. some help for CBT, not some value. But in this culture, most people are either offered drugs or offered CBT, right? Both of which have some value, but if, if you've been offered, if those are the only things you've been offered, and someone appears to be coming along, especially if they've heard about the shadow book and not the actual book, someone appears to be coming along going, well, this thing, which is the one thing that you're being given to help you to get through the day, is going to be taken away from you or you should junk it or it's not real or it's not true. I can well understand why that causes volcanic anger. Now, A, that's not what I'm saying. B, it's a tragedy that in this culture, those are the only things people have been offered. 
Yeah. That's that's a horrifying tragedy. So I understand that where that response comes from, and there would have been many periods in my life when I was acutely depressed and taking antidepressants and experiencing all sorts of negative side effects like obesity, like 70% of men, it affected my sexual functioning. For me, the chemical antidepressants were causing real harm and after that initial period, were not, were not reducing my depression, which is not the experience of everyone. And yet I would have been profoundly angered. To be, and I remember being angered when I would read people saying, well, there's a limited effect to chemical antidepressants, so we need to have a wider approach. Because, And also in this culture, a lot of people are trapped, right? A lot of people, you know, um, and it, it, again, and this is more, a, this is a characteristic of the shadow book, not my actual book. But if someone who has a very privileged life as I do, uh, although I came from a working class family, I'm now very privileged, um, seems to be saying, you know, and this is very much not what my book says, but if people think you're saying, hey, you're, you're depressed and anxious, well, you know, go and sit on a beach in Bali and meditate, right? That, that appears as a profound insult to people because they say quite rightly, I can't do that, right? That is not an option available to me, which is why we need to talk about, which is why a, a big part of the last third of Lost Connections where I'm talking about solutions is partly about things people can do as individuals, but mostly about how we can change our society to set more people free to do those things that we know reduce depression. Because for example, one of my closest relatives is a struggling single mom who works every hour she can to, you know, um, pay the rent and keep her kids in their home. And when she gets home, she's so exhausted, she can barely watch the television. The idea of saying to her, well, your job now is to fight for a universal basic income, to democratise your workplace, to learn loving kindness. It would be grotesque to say all that to her, right? She, she can't do that, which is why we need to change the society to set her free to do those things. Yeah, absolutely. And when I was asking the question, I, if it came across that way... Oh, I, no, I didn't think you were saying I, that But at I all, didn't no. mean to lay in any shame on anyone that is taking antidepressants like quite the opposite that yeah. this culture of saying it's your fault there's something wrong with you you need to change is part of the problem exactly and you know you asked me like earlier you know, what made you an activist and we were talking about mm. that and you know I was saying that I was born into a middle class family and I've seen that as giving me an enormous privilege to talk about things that need to be talked about, to put my name to things, to make noise and to try and create some of these changes because I'm not in a cycle where I'm worrying about how I'm going to feed myself that day or worrying about, you know, how long I spend on the toilet when I'm at work or all of these horrific things that are, is the reality for many people. And so I do think that we have in any community, in any society, there's a shared responsibility and we don't all have equal parts of it because we're not equal, right? So we all have to do the bit that we can. Yeah, I think all the time, a huge influence, on, probably the biggest influence on my life were my grandmother's my, my mother was quite ill when I was a child and my dad was in a different country, so I was raised mostly by my maternal grandmother. And My grandmother's had really hard lives. Like my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, left school when she was 13 to go and work in a, a laundry and then a factory, and she was widowed when she was very young in you know, working-class Scottish tenements, and there was no help. She had three kids, no help at all. Um, my grandmother had a hard, hard life. My Swiss grandmother, you know, was stuck on this mountain in Switzerland. Again, had a very, no one gave a shit about my grand, paternal grandmother. She was never accorded any freedoms, any love, any, any, and she had a really hard life. I grew up with a very strong sense, because I adored both my grandma, I loved my grandmothers, that no one was standing up for them, right? I could just see, I was just having quite young thinking, but these people are amazing. Why is everyone treating them like shit mm. or completely ignoring them? Why, why does no one ever help them with anything? And so I have this very strong sense that, that I'm the first person in my family 
who would ever be accorded just the time to think about any of this stuff, right? You know, my parents both left school when they were 15. My grandparents all left school when they were between the age of 13 and 14. You know, my, my, you go back two generations and we're talking about Swiss peasants and Scottish working class people who, you know, were working constantly and very, I mean, it literally killed my grandfather uh, to work that way. But I also think to go back to saying you said that I think is really interesting as well. And, and relates to what you were asking about a little bit earlier, I was just thinking of it, is I think part of the problem you were saying about how people feel when they when they hear you're talking this more complex way. And I think a big part of the challenge is, this was true with what I wrote about addiction as well, from my previous book, Chasing the Screen. Very often in this culture, people are offered two narratives for things like depression or addiction. Either you are biologically broken, so it's a problem with your brain or your body, or you're morally flawed, right? So people think the path out of saying you're just morally flawed, you're lazy, you're self-indulgent, you're hedonistic in the case of addiction or whatever, is, well, I'm not morally flawed, I'm, I'm, I've got a problem with my brain, I'm biologically broken, right? It's important to stress there are real changes that happen in the brain when people become depressed and addicted that do make it somewhat harder to get out. That's the some biological truth. But, and when someone comes along and says, okay, you're not morally flawed and the biology is somewhat overstated. If you talk about how the, 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 the biological determinants have been somewhat overstated, what a lot of people hear is, oh, fuck, so you're saying it's my fault, right? And when you come along and offer a third option, which is, right, you may have some individual flaws like everyone else. There is some component to this which where your biology can make you more vulnerable to it. But actually, most of what's going on here is factors in the way we live. And you didn't design the society, right? Although you can help change it. I think that can be, particularly in the US, it's like talking a language that we haven't... It's like you're speaking to people in a language we haven't taught to think in, right? You know, when you and I were kids... Margaret Thatcher famously said, there's no such thing as society, there's only individuals and their families. And I think it's a sign of how deeply Margaret Thatcher won. That, think about me, right? I've always hated Margaret Thatcher, right? I studied social sciences, I'm a lefty, and I was depressed for a long time, and it never occurred to me that there were deep social factors that related to my depression. It never even crossed my mind. That's a sign of how deeply yeah. that vision won, right? Um, yeah, me too. I have a similar story with that. Yeah, I don't need to say it because yeah, it's kind right. of similar, you know, yeah, yeah. like I thought, well, what's wrong with me? Exactly. And, and if you and me are thinking that, right, and we have lots of tools from our political understanding that should have led us to that, I can well understand why it takes time to adjust to this different way of thinking because it took... And also, if you've got a story about your pain... Even if it's not a good story and it's not a story that's working well for you. To me, it's like having a dog on a leash, right? A rabid dog, at least on a leash, at least you know where it is, right? And there's a moment when you're adjusting a story about your pain, when it's like the dog is let off the leash. There is nothing worse than feeling you are in pain and do not understand why, right? That is the most terrible to have. Pain with no story about your pain is the worst thing that can happen to you, right? Because uh, you don't know when it'll end. You don't know when. I remember when my nephew was, um, one of my nephews was about four. He got a really bad, bad vomiting bug. And my sister got it as well as mum. Got it as well. So I looked after him for a few days. I remember on like the third day, it was a side he truly inherited my family's drama queen, Jean, as well. He looked at me very seriously and he said, um, Johan, will I ever stop vomiting or will it be like this for the rest of my life? Right. And I thought, of course, he's not, he doesn't have a story about what a vomiting bug is. So he doesn't know, oh, you're vomiting now, but you're not going to be vomiting in a few days and you'll be okay, right? So I said, no, 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 Josh, it's okay. You're not going to be, you know, soon you're not going to be fine. But in a sense, when your story is taken away from you or is diminished, you're a bit like my nephew was when he was four. Well, what is this then? What's going to happen to me, right? Mm -hmm. But we can construct a more truthful and honest and loving story about why we're feeling this way and more importantly i think we have to because these are signals right the fact that depression has risen so much you know i'm 40 in a few weeks almost every year i've been alive depression and anxiety have increased right that is telling us something it's not telling us that suddenly all our biology mutated year after year in the last 40 years right 
It's telling us something's going wrong in the way we live. And what we've been doing is path- either insulting that signal by saying, oh, these people are just crazy, or they're weak and they need to toughen up, or pathologizing that signal by saying it's just a biological problem. And that's a disaster, because if you can't hear the signal, you can't deal with it, you can't respond to it. I actually think, although I, this is going beyond what I can prove, I think if we had listened to this signal years ago, we would not have had Trump and we would not have had Brexit. And we would not have had Jair Bolsonaro and Marine Le Pen nearly winning the French election and or become, coming second in the French election or the Alternative for Deutschland in, in, in Germany rising as much as they all have. Because those two are signals of... If you're psychological, think about that woman I met in Cleveland, if, you're, if your needs are not met by the society, you're going to get a larger and larger number of people who say, fucking burn it down then. Now, I'm not apologising for those people. They made a terrible mistake. I begged that woman to vote for Hillary Clinton, right? And don't misunderstand me. I begged my relatives who voted for Brexit to not do it. But we have to hear the signal. The signal is meaningful. It's telling us something. It's not telling us that people are weak or stupid or biologically broken. It's telling us that we've constructed a society that has many great things about it, but that is not meeting people's needs. And, 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 we, and we can change that and we can make a society that does meet people's needs. There are loads of practical ways we can do it. And I saw so many people doing that all over the world that I write about in the, in the book, you know. And, but, but to get there, we have to have an accurate story of what's going on. If you don't have an accurate map, you can't find your way through the territory. If your map is misleading or only focuses on one part of the terrain, y- you, you, can't, you can't go on the journey you need to go on. Hello, this is Amisha. We are just taking a little break from the conversation here. On behalf of myself and the team, I want to say thank you for being part of creating a beautiful future. We make this for you so that we will all have the vision, wisdom and activism we need at this time to weave a new narrative. Can you help us with this? You can do that by making a monthly donation to the podcast to cover our costs just the equivalent of a fair trade banana you might eat or a chai latte you might drink whilst you listen to this will make a huge difference to us. Head to www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash community to become a monthly patron. And the other thing is to tell your friends about this podcast so they can tune in too. Send them a message or post on social media and let them know what you love about it. And whilst you're at it, leave us a review. And now, back to the conversation. Thank you for your loving beauty. What is the research um, that you've found around creating the future and what it is that we might need in order to create a more connected future? There's loads, but I would talk that two things come to mind. One is a really interesting piece of, piece of research about the, how we think about the future. As a lot of your listeners will know, Canada has a large First Nations population, so what in the US they call Native Americans, who are the descendants of people who survived the genocide that took place when the European invasion of the Americas happened. Those survivors, descendants of the survivors, have horrifyingly high suicide rates in Canada, like exponentially higher than... Um, European descended and Chinese descended um, and other immigrant groups into Canada, right? A really interesting guy I interviewed called Professor Michael Chandler did research on this. He's interested looking at well, why the suicide rates are high and what, what can we do about it? And Canada has 192 First Nations, what are sometimes called tribes, but national groups. And he looked at the figures and figured and saw that actually some of them have extremely high suicide rates. The the national groups and some have no suicide rates at all and he was thinking well what's what's going on there then right why 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 do some of them have very high suicide rates and some have no suicide at all so we started to look at i spent years and years researching this gathering figure see well, what are the correlations and can we track can we figure out some causation and what we found was really interesting so some of those um groups in canada now there's many other things going on like you know lots of this is not the only factor I think it's relevant to what we're talking about. What we found was some of those groups have banded together and regained control of certain aspects of their culture. Like they've rebuilt their language, 
they've um, got control of their own fire service, their police, their um, their school system. And some have been kept so beaten down, they've not done that. Uh, so some have regained collective control, not individual control, but collective control, and some have not regained collective control. And the suicide rate, you can look at the graph online if you go Google Michael Chandler, First Nations people, the, the suicide rate tracks extremely closely with the amount of collective control you have of your culture. So if you live in a community that controls its own destiny, you are m- much less likely to commit suicide than if you don't. And he argues, and he gives a lot of evidence about this, that this is partly about a sense of the future. If you control your community, you feel that you understand where you and your people will be in the future. And if you have no control, you don't understand. You're just like a pinball being whacked around a machine, right? Mm. A pinball machine. So I think part of it is about establishing collective control. And I go through lots of ways and lots of people who've done that all over the world, but who I met. But I'll give you an example. It's one we mentioned, the East London one. So one of the heroes of my book, Lost Connections, is this wonderful man called Dr. Sam Everington. He's such a wonderful person, Sam. So Sam's a a doctor in East London, uh, near where I used to live. So, although Sandy was never my doctor, a poor, poor part of East London. Sam had loads of people coming to him with depression and anxiety. And he was really uncomfortable because like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He thinks they have a role. But he could also see most of the people he was giving them to remain depressed and most of them were depressed for perfectly understandable reasons. Like, for example, loneliness. So one day he had this idea to start to pioneer a different approach. A woman came to see him, who I got to know later quite well, called Lisa Cunningham. She's a wonderful person. And Lisa had been shut away in her home for seven years with just crippling depression and anxiety. And Sam said to Lisa, don't worry, I'm going to carry on giving you these drugs. I'm also going to prescribe something else. I'm going to prescribe for you to take part in a group. There was an area behind the doctor's surgery that was known as Dog Shit Alley, which gives you a sense of what it was like just like scrubland, where dogs would in fact shit. Sam said to Lisa, what I'd like you to do is come and turn out a couple of times a week. I'm going to come too because I've been pretty depressed. In fact, he'd been quite anxious. And what we'll do is we'll just have a group of depressed and anxious people and we'll do something together. The first time the group met, Lisa was literally physically sick with anxiety. But the group started to work on what they could do, and they decided they were going to turn Dog Shit Alley into a garden, into a lovely garden. These inner city East London people like me didn't know anything about gardening. But they're like, OK, we're going to learn gardening. They started to read about it, look about it on the internet. They started to get their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that exposure to the natural world is a really powerful antidepressant, even in gardens. But something else happened. They started to form a group. They started to form a tribe. You know, they would notice if someone didn't turn up and someone else would go and check on them. They started to care about each other. They had a collective project that they controlled. People started to tell them how beautiful the garden looked. They started to feel they had a function in the society. They were producing something beautiful and good. And the way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. There was a study in Norway of a very similar program that's part of a growing body of research that showed this pr- that it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants in moving people on the Hamilton scale that we were talking about earlier. I think for kind of obvious reason, right? It was dealing with some of the reasons why they were depressed and anxious in the first place. And this is something I saw all over the world. The best strategies for dealing with depression and anxiety are the ones that deal with the reasons why we feel like this. And... And I I saw that in so many places that when you, when you acknowledge that depression and anxiety and addiction have more complex causes than just your biology, although there's a real biological component, you can begin to find solutions that you couldn't see if you thought about it in a more narrow way. And, And it goes back to what you're saying about Big Pharma. I don't think Big Pharma is the main reason we don't see these narratives. I think it's the things we we're talking about that we've created such an individualistic society that can't think in social categories because we've been blocked from thinking that way. But I do think it, it, that there's pretty strong evidence. It's relevant that there's a $10 billion industry telling Lisa that there's just a problem in her brain. And there's a $0 billion industry in getting her to go gardening with some people that she's going to start to care about. 
that is relevant. It's not the main reason why we don't see these solutions. I don't think some people disagree with me, but I do think it's a real, real factor, and it's and it's setting us off on a path that gives some relief to some people, but is not solving the problem. Mm. And we need to think in a more honest and complex and and loving way, because I think it's kind of an insult to people's pain to tell. I mean, it's a really a, a person you should definitely interview is again one of the heroes of the book. Um, who, who taught, who's done incredible research on, um, I think, the sickest expression of this way of talking. It's a woman called Dr. Joanne Cassiatore. So she's one of the leading experts on traumatic grief in the United States. She's based in Arizona. She, she became a specialist in this after her, her own daughter, Cheyenne, died in childbirth. And, and Dr. Cassiatore noticed lots of people in the position she was in whose children die were immediately being offered drugs and often being told they had developed a mental illness, right? So she's done research that shows 9% of parents whose children die are drugged in the first 48 hours in the United States. And she's working with, she's often working with people who have been through the most extreme forms of bereavement. So, you know, people whose children have been burned alive in attacks and just terrible things. And there was one instance which is not atypical her mother whose son had died and she told her doctor that at night when she was trying to get to sleep she would sometimes hear her son's voice talking to her and it would be a comforting thing and her doctor diagnosed her with psychosis and started drugging her with antipsychotics and Dr Cassiatorian did this research this and she discovered a particularly revealing moment in the history of how mental health is thought about that I think tells us about where we're going wrong. So in the 1970s, the American Psychiatric Association, the APA, who are the main body of psychiatrists in the United States, decided to standardize how they diagnose depression. Because up to then, people, doctors were just using different definitions. And so they were going to standardize it. They drew up a list of 10 criteria symptoms of depression. And they said, they distribute them to psychiatrists all across the United States. And they said, if your patient shows more than six of these 10 symptoms for more than two weeks, you should diagnose him or her with this mental health problem and give them the help you can. So they distribute this all over the country. And within a short period, psychiatrists start to come back and go, look, we've got a bit of a problem here. If we diagnose people using these criteria we're going to have to diagnose every grieving person in the United States as mentally ill because it turns out everyone who's grieving shows these symptoms, things like crying a lot, feeling pessimistic, you, you, you know, all these things. And the APA were like, oh, well, that's not what we meant, right? Uh, clearly that's not what they intended. So they drew up something that became known later as the grief loophole, where they said, okay, use these 10 symptoms if people show more than six of them for more than two weeks, diagnosed with mentally ill, except if they've lost someone they love in the last year, in which case this is a perfectly healthy reaction, normal, doesn't count, they're not mad, right? They're not mentally ill. And so doctors started using that. But that begs a really obvious question, right? If what we're saying is depression is a brain disease that's caused by chemical imbalance in people's brains, except there's one situation in life where actually it's an understandable and normal response, which is when someone you love dies, well, how come that's the only situation where it's a legitimate response and you're not mentally ill, right? Why not if you lose your house? Why not if you lose your job? Why not if you're stuck in a job you hate for the next 40 years? Why not if your husband cheats on you? Why not? You suddenly, but what that does is it forces us to acknowledge that depression has a context, right? And as Professor Ca Dr. Cassiatore says, the system is not built to accommodate context. That's not what the Western mental health system uh, while there are many great practitioners in it, that's not what the system is designed to do. It's based on the model of infectious disease, right? You've got these symptoms, we give you this pill, right? Mm -hmm. And that is not a good system for thinking about human pain and distress. So what happened is the APA gradually whittled down the time period in which the loophole, the time period covered by the loophole. So initially it was if someone you love had died in the last year, uh, then they cut it down to six months, they cut it down to three months. Now it's just gone. They got rid of it in the last version of their kind of psychiatric Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So now if your child dies at 10 a.m., 
you know, your doctor can say, well, have you been feeling these things for the last couple of weeks? And a lot of people in pregnancy have. So they can say, well, you could diagnose you that moment, that day, right? That hour, if you're, if you're showing extreme, if you're showing distress, and in fact, that is happening as Dr. Cassiatore showed, 9% of, of, as I say, 9% of grieving parents are diagnosed in the first 48 hours. And she said, this is a really good illustration of what we're getting wrong, right? Grief is not a mental illness. Grief is not a malfunction. We grieve because we have loved, right? If you tell me your aunt died, right? I would feel sad for you, but I don't know your aunt, right? I won't grieve for your aunt. If someone I love dies, I grieve because I have loved them. It is a tribute to my love. That's not to say it's not terribly painful. It's terribly painful, but it is an essential part of being human, right? And it's a signal. It tells us something really deep and meaningful that you loved that person. And it is heartbreaking that they're gone and we can't bring them back, right? And it, in a similar way, I don't think it's a coincidence that grief and depression have the same symptoms, right? I think what depression is in part is grief for your own needs not being met. Now, when someone we love dies, there's some, nothing we can do except hold the survivors and love them and value them and honour the memory of the person who died and take their legacy forward. But when, you, when you're grieving for your own needs not being met, well, there's a lot we can do about that, right? Dr. Cassiatore puts it so well when she says this, 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 the, the grief loophole and what it reveals is that as a society, as a culture, we just don't get human pain, right? And she explains, you know, we've built a system that's built on the idea of you're given us an allocated amount of pain. Uh, you know, it was two weeks by the time they got rid of it. After which you should be back and functioning and back at work and you should be a little worker drone again. And if you've still got pain after that, well, then there's some little malfunction that needs, the machine needs to be tinkered with. To, it's a sick way of thinking about human pain. It's an inhuman way of thinking about human pain. It's... um. And that, while that's an extreme example, I think it does show a flaw in the wider way we have of thinking about mental health, particularly in the United States. It's not to say that all practitioners follow that model. Most practitioners know there's something wrong with that way of thinking and want to be more humane. And we haven't given them, in many some cases we have, but in many cases we haven't given them the tools to be more humane. We have to think more deeply, more lovingly, and in a more complex way about these about these problems, I think. Yeah, absolutely. You, you use this word connection, and famously you've said the opposite of addiction is connection, and you chose the word connections for the title of this book. What does it really mean? Like, how do we know when we're experiencing connection what is that like felt sense of connection? Because if we're talking about it becoming something that is part of society, you know, we're talking about it, the the frameworks of it, pr the prescribing of it. What is it, and how does it feel? And maybe for you, like, how did it feel when you experienced real connection? So I think. There are many ways you can think about connection, and certainly I'm not going to say anything definitive about it because I don't think you can. This is one of the deepest human questions. So when I initially talked about this in relation to addiction, I think some people thought I meant exclusively social connection, right? And that's a really important part of connection, but I don't think it's the only part. One of the key aspects of connection is being connected to your underlying psychological needs and having your underlying psychological needs met. So, you know, and I, I go through in, in Lost Connections some of the kind of underlying needs that we have as human beings, for which there's very strong evidence, and this has been known since the 1950s in, in kind of the science of psychology, but it's also been known by human beings for as long as there have been human beings. You know, so for example, people need to have meaningful work, right? In this society, only 13% of people like their jobs. And that's the thing we do most of our waking lives. That's a key reason why we're so unhappy. And I, I talk about the science of um, actually this very strong evidence from an amazing man called Professor Michael Marmot. The key factor that causes depression at work is if you go to work tomorrow and you have low or no control over your work, you're much more likely to become depressed and anxious. And I talk about how we can give people back control over their works. Work, we shouldn't be working in corporations. We should be working in democratic cooperatives. We should change the basic structure in which we work as a society. And there's evidence surrounding that, and I go through it in the book, but... When a human being is connected, they're in a state where there's two things going on. One is their deeper needs as human beings are being met, so they're connected to their deeper needs. 
and they're connected, they feel that they are flowing into other people and other people are flowing into them. The moments of connection. So I think the research from psychedelics, um, mm. the growing field of research of psychedelics gives us some insights into this. Uh, and I interview, so people will know in the... Yeah, we've covered this yeah, quite a bit yeah, on yeah. the show as well. Yeah, yeah. So until the, the as your listeners know, until the mid-60s, there was a lot of research into psychedelics. It was promising. It wasn't done to the standards we'd want it to be done now, but it was interesting scientific research about giving LSD to people with alcoholism problems or um, depression as treatment resistant depression and so on. And then it's all kind of shut down by the Nixon administration. And then last nine years, it's really reopened. So I went to interview scientists who worked on this in for the book in Baltimore, Los Angeles, here in London, uh, in New York, in Sao Paulo, and in Aarhus in Denmark. Obviously, I learned loads of things that I write about. But to me, there's, there's one aspect that I think helps us to answer your question in a really interesting way. So at Johns Hopkins, led by a, a great guy called um, Professor Roland Griffiths, they did this research where they take um, long-term smokers who've tried to quit in all sorts of different ways. So people like my mother. My mother smokes about 70 cigarettes a day. There's an amazing photograph of me and my mother. When I'm a baby, I'm about six months old, she's breastfeeding me, smoking and resting the ashtray on my stomach. <laughs> and so people like my mum. And um, they gave them three doses of psilocybin, which is the active component in magic mushrooms, spread over, I think, six months. And astonishingly, 80% of them stopped smoking. And a year later, 60% of them still non-smokers, right? It's a small study, so you don't make too many generalizations, right? But that's a remarkable result. To give you a sense, the next most successful smoking cessation tool is nicotine patches, which has a 17% success rate. So extraordinary effect. But there's a sub-finding in all of this research, things like smoking cessation, reduction in depression, which the research did here in London and lots of others, which I think is really important. Most people who take psychedelics experience something that can be broadly described as a spiritual experience, so interpreting that broadly, a moment when your ego walls come down and you feel deeply connected to the natural world, to people around you, whatever it is. But that, the intensity of that spiritual experience varies. Some people have a super intense spiritual experience, feel the ego's gone. Some people have no spiritual experience at all. And it turns out the positive effects like stopping smoking and reduction in depression correlate very closely to whether you have that spiritual experience, right? And to me, what's what's interesting about that, and it fits with the other things we know about psychedelics and about connection more broadly, is it's not that these psychedelics flip a chemical switch in your brain. Of course, there's a chemical process that happens, but and that, and that leaves your brain changed in some of these very reductive ways that it's talked about. What it gives you is a taste of what it feels like to be deeply connected to be released from the prison of your own ego, from, as one of the scientists put it, your addiction to your own ego, to be released in that moment when you feel deeply connected. And then it's up to us together to find ways to build that, because most people are not going to want to take psychedelics that often, to find a way to change our lives so that we can live that way more. It's more like it sets a, a direction on a compass in which we can then travel and find ways to travel, right? Because... So there was an interesting study, part of the study here in London. In London, at UCL, at University College London, two people I really admire, Professor David Nutt and um, Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, did this research where they took very tre treatment resistant, depressed people, very depressed people, give them psilocybin. And again, it was early, this was an early study and it didn't have a control group. So you want to handle the results with a bit of care, as they would say, as they would be the first to point out. But what they found was it had an extraordinary effect, it really significantly reduced depression. But there's a kind of sub clause to that. So Robin, Dr. Carhart Harris, told me interesting aspect of this. So there was a woman who took part in the depression psilocybin trial, been depressed for a really long time, takes the psilocybin, realizes she can be deeply connected, has this great experience, feels much less depressed, and then goes back to work in a kind of kind of grim seaside town in England in an office. And you cannot work in an office and go around thinking, hey, we're all connected, we're all the same, egos don't matter. I mean, you, you won't keep your job for very long. But I've experienced that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Her capacity to... The, 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 the environment in which she's forced to live militated against the insight, the antidepressant insights yeah. that came from the psychedelic experience. And she became depressed again, right? Yeah. And I think that tells us something. In a sense, the insights that come from the psychedelic research confirm what we know from all sorts of non-psychedelic research. 
which is if you create environments where people can feel connected and have meaning, uh, they'll be much less depressed, anxious, and addicted. But that requires us to change the environment in ways that are in line with the insights that come from these experiences and from the science surrounding them. And that's a bigger challenge, but can be done, right? And I think often, particularly this moment when I've been going around talking about the capacity for social change, a lot of people's response is, yeah, I agree, but have you seen the news lately, right? And I think it's worth stressing a few things. Firstly, everyone listening to this program is a beneficiary of an incredible social change that seemed impossible at the time, right? My grandma, the women listening don't need me to mansplain this, but my grandmothers were not allowed to have their own <laughs> bank accounts yeah. when they got married, right? Um, I'm gay. I'm nearly 40. I didn't even hear the concept of gay marriage until I was in my 20s, right? Now I can get married. There are incredible, every, the weekend was a radical utopian idea when it was first proposed in the 1860s. And now it, we take it for granted as an, a, an everyday part of life, right? Or a two days out of every seven part of life. Extraordinary social changes can happen when people fight for them. And the one advantage to living in this time when so many things are collapsing and there is so much horror is firstly, no one can deny the alarm bells are going off, right? The, the, the fire alarms are sounding, right? Something is really wrong. And that opens up the potential for change, both in the negative and catastrophic sense that Trump and Bolsonaro and Brexit are, but also opens up radical possible possibilities for positive change. The most popular politician in the United States is Bernie Sanders, who would have been regarded, and in fact was regarded as a marginal kook figure as recently as, you know, four years ago. I mean, it wasn't regarded that way by me, I want to stress, but by, by the kind of uh, <laughs> culture. When people get band together and fight for progressive change, it can absolutely happen. In a way, things are more hospitable to progressive change now than they've been for a long time because the system is falling apart and we can be the ones who build the alternative, right? Um, and I think that's that's really important for us to think about. Absolutely. And I mean, that's a huge theme of this podcast. Uh, many of the guests have been sharing different ways that we can do this. Yeah, there's a... There's a huge opportunity in these moments where the systems feel like they're no longer serving us anymore. Perhaps something beautiful can emerge from that space. I mean, it will. And it's up to us, right? And when I get depressed about this, I try to imagine. So um, one of my closest friends is a wonderful and amazing person called Andrew Sullivan. He's a writer, a British American writer. And um, I think about this thing that Andrew did, this particular moment in Andrew's life. So. In 1994, it was the height of the AIDS crisis and Andrew was diagnosed as HIV positive. And lots of his friends had already died of, in the AIDS crisis. More people, in fact, more Americans had died than died in Vietnam by that point. And Andrew, there was no treatment on, no good treatment in, in sight. And so Andrew thought he had a short time to live. And he went to Provincetown, the place I went this summer, this little place in Cape Cod, to die. And he decided he was going to do one last thing. He was going to write a book about a crazy utopian idea. He was like, okay, well, I'm not going to live to see this. No one alive now is going to live to see this, but maybe somewhere down the line, someone will pick up this book and this idea. The idea he wrote the first book ever advocating was gay marriage. And when I get depressed, I try to imagine going back in time, whatever it is from 1994 to now, 20, how many years? I can never, I'm terrible at maths. Uh, uh, from 1994 to now is... 2014 would be, it's 25 years, 25 years next year. So I try to imagine going back 25 years and saying to Andrew, okay, you're not going to believe me, um, but 22 years from now, A, you'll be alive. Great news. <laughs> he wouldn't have believed it. B, you'll be married to a man. C, I'll be with you when the Supreme Court of the United States quotes this book you're writing now, when it makes a ruling saying that it is mandatory for every state in the United States to introduce gay marriage. And the next day, you're going to get an invitation from the President of the United States to go for dinner that night at a White House that will be lit up in the colours of the rainbow flag to celebrate what you and all the people who are going to join this fight have achieved. Oh, and by the way, that President who's going to invite you, he'll be black, right? That would have sounded like the most ludicrous science fiction you can imagine. It would be like me saying to you, okay, so 25 years from now, a transgender president is going to invite us to the Oval Office to smoke crack with her because it will have just been legalised, right? Not that that's what we want. I mean, the transgender president, yes, the crack, no. But incredible changes can happen, both the good and bad. 
the difference is whether people fight for them, right? And people fought for gay marriage. And it was an unlikely fight. If you had said 25 years ago that gay marriage will be far more popular in Ireland than the Catholic Church, that would have sounded like absolute madness, right? Mm -hmm. We live to see that happen. Andrew lived to see that transformation. Um, Incredible things can happen. Absolutely. And catastrophes can happen. And the difference is whether what we fight for. Yeah, we're each creating them. Exactly. Collectively, we're creating it all. Exactly. That's exactly it. Exactly. Thank you so much, Johan. Hooray. I should also (laughs) say, because my publishers keep telling me off if I don't do this, anyone who wants any more information about where they can get the book or the audio book, which I read myself, um, if they go to www.thelostconnections.com, if they want to know about my other book about addiction, it's www.chasingthescream.com. And on those sites, you can listen to loads of audio. Of loads of the people we've been talking about, loads of the experts, and there's people at Cotty, loads of people. You can take a quiz to see how much you know about these subjects. You can watch videos of me talking about them. Well, let's leave a little surprise for what they can find exactly. to do that. Exactly. Okay, <laughs> Just yeah, go right. to the website. Exactly. God damn it. Uh, and of course, we're going to post links to everything. Not quite right. everything, because you have mentioned a lot of <laughs> names and, yeah. and things, but we'll try and catch uh the main ones johan thank you for giving us this time we both started this interview feeling very ill and i think (laughs) we've done a wonderful job of not dying of not dying (laughs) healing exactly that's the health that's the positive way of thinking about it right um and really it's a it's a great privilege to get to be inside this kaleidoscopic brain of so much information and research and dot connecting that you offer Hooray. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book, and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, and so it's made possible with you, our community. If you loved this and would like to fund our show with a monthly donation or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community and support. Please also share with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so we can grow. Those gold stars really help others find us so these ideas can spread. Here is to us creating a beautiful future together. The Future is Beautiful is made by an all-female team working voluntarily or on reduced rates until our listener support grows. If you have been moved by anything you heard here, please donate the equivalent of buying us a drink. All donations make a huge difference to us and will allow us to keep doing this and remain advertising free. Until next time, I leave you with this question. How will you create beauty in the world?